Our text this morning is Colossians chapter three, and um, we're gonna we're gonna finish up the three verses that I didn't get to last week. So glad you guys were able to make it. Yeah, I got through one verse last week. Hey, we had communion, right? So I mean, it was like a lot going on. Um, but uh, just really thankful that you're able to be here this morning and pray that the Lord will just really speak to your heart, that the Spirit of God would just open fresh and new, you know, his word to us. These are maybe familiar verses that we've all read and heard, but the Lord wants to speak to each one of us in some way. Um, so let's just ask him for that this morning. Lord, we're just really thankful for the opportunity that we have to be here. For the body of Christ, it's awesome what you've done. It is. It's a beautiful mystery, and your manifold wisdom of grace, mercy, justice, love, peace, just the revelation of who you are and the manifestation of you, who you are in this world, it comes through us as your people. And so, Lord, we don't want to take that for granted. We want to walk in your way. We pray, Lord, that you would touch our hearts this morning as we look at your word. Uh, your word is beautiful because there is always something new and there's always something that is there hidden within it that uh, your spirit brings forth to our hearts and uh, satisfies our soul. Lord, without it, we're lost. We, we don't know who you are. We wouldn't know what life is. We wouldn't know the possibility of this beautiful life that you've blessed us with. So Lord, we just thank you for your word and we pray that you would be glorified this morning as we just look at it and treasure it and put it in our heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, um, yeah, it's a blessing to be here. I, you know, it's a blessing to be able to uh, come before you guys and to just share, you know, what the Lord has given. And um and it's also a blessing. It's kind of a double blessing for me because I get to um, I get to fill in for Jeff as he has a relaxing vacation, and to know that you know him giving and pouring his life into the ministry here, he's able to take a break, and to know that the Lord will speak, and we pray that He will this morning to us. So it's a blessing to be a part of that and to be a part of God's plan for the body. Well, let's um, let's read this uh, together this morning. Um, we're going to start in verse 1, and then we'll read through verse 4. If then you were raised with Christ, <clears throat> seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I mean, these are just glorious verses, aren't they? They just really remind us of our position. I entitled this, <clears throat> this message uh, and these messages in a mirror dimly because really, we'll, we'll just have a little bit of recap on what we talked about last week. Really, sometimes it's hard for us to understand really that, and we don't feel like in the circumstances or in the mundane parts of life that we're really living out the life of Christ. And we're not really living out truly what the resurrection is all about. In In a way, you know, we understand the reality. We hear it you know, we hear it on Sunday mornings, we talk about it, we have it here written in the word, and yet we don't really experience or live in the totality of what the resurrection is, and that and what it does in our hearts and in our lives, and how it works out through us. And we know that there is more, and that is the blessing, and that's what I hope that you see this morning as we, as we walk through this, and as we look at that, that there's more. There's a fresh new something <laughs> that the Lord wants to do in your heart and my heart, how he wants to open up his word in a way that maybe it's just been something, you know, uh, you know, the life that we have in Christ, something that we talk about and that we see, but I'm not really experiencing it. This is an opportunity to allow the spirit of God just to really work within your heart and your life that we would know not just, you know, what we've been told and the reality of it, but actually that we would start to experience more and more in a fresh new way. Last week we looked at, uh, seeking the things that are above. And I suggested that there, there's a lot of things above, right? I mean, we could, we could list off a lot of things, but, uh, there were three that I just, you know, general things that really we, our heart should be drawn to and pushing towards. And we do that in certain ways through love, through compassion, through that. But, but, but these three things, we need to be reminded of this, that we need to be seeking 
You know, tearing things apart to, to understand and to seek his kingdom. Because we know his kingdom is not just, it's just not somewhere out there. It's, it's in the hearts of men. It's here. It's among us. God is working among us. And his kingdom is in this world around us as he's working. And we need to see that in that spiritual way, that we are a part of that kingdom. We talked about how the kingdom is really about the king. The will of the king is what is reflected through a kingdom. It's not like, you know, our democracy or our representative, uh, you know, uh, whatever we have right now <laughs> that is kind of, you know, falling apart, really. It's hard to define what what actually is going on. Um, but, you know, it's different than that. It's different what we, from what we're experiencing. It's a kingdom with a king. And we are to do our kingdom or our king's will. And that's the second thing is that we are to seek the thing. Another thing that's above is his will, that we would look for that in the certain situations and circumstances that we're in. And that we would, you know, use the body that he's given to us to live that out in the world today. Um, the third thing is his presence that, um, that, you know, we are to be seeking his presence in all things, you know, even though we don't see him face to face, you know, we can experience God's presence. Have you experienced God's presence in your life? Have you experienced him as you are walking through life? Maybe in a difficult circumstance, maybe you're not knowing what's going on and you're just praying, Lord, show yourself to me. We're going to look at another passage here that really shows us a beautiful heart of Moses seeking the presence of God. And that's something that we should be doing. That's something that's above. It's something that we should be experiencing as his children, as his people. And so those things are a, a beautiful thing. But in order to really be able to seek the things above, we have to set our minds on the things above. To seek it and to know what we're seeking, we have to have a, a mindset that actually allows that seeking heart to really come out and come through and where our life is directed, not just into the things of this world and the things that are on the earth, but the things that are above that we'll be able to, in you know, that our mind would be set upon those things and not upon the things that are here on this earth. Um, you know, this idea of setting, it's not just, uh, you know, just having a few thoughts about something or, you know, having something go through your mind. It's just not one thought, but it is a process. And what this process that's being talked about, setting your mind on the things above, this process is involving not just thoughts, not just the things that you think in your mind, but it's, it, it incorporates, and the idea is that it's incorporating, it's incorporating the affections, what you love, what you like, what you want, and the will. So it's not just thoughts that just kind of blow through and you just think these things. It is an active where you're setting your affections. You're bringing those things to play in the situation that you find yourself in. And that you're, you're looking for those things, your, your, your affections are set on the things that are above. And that's, you know, that's what this verse really says. Set your minds on the things above, not on the things of the earth. So there's this active nature. And, and when we do that, then we can see that actually our, it changes the way that we live our life. It changes the words that we say. It changes the thought pattern. It changes how we respond to people. It gives us, you know, the things that we really need, like compassion. It opens us up for the working of the Holy Spirit when our mind is set upon these things and we're allowing that to happen. I just, I, I oftentimes think in pictures and, you know, last week we talked about the cave and just how uh, that cave that we went into, it kind of... Uh, it's a great picture of life, really, that we don't see everything that is there. You know, there's a spiritual nature to life and to the resurrection and to what Jesus has done for us and the life that we have in Jesus. That there are, there are things that we just don't see about it. And, you know, sometimes we're going through this process of sanctification. We're growing in the Lord. It's, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it squishes us, you know, and presses on us. But yet... You know, but we end up seeing the glory of God in all kinds of different ways. Well, that picture, is, I think, is really good for that. But I have another one for setting your mind on things. I'm a kind of a project guy, and I like projects. And right now I'm in the middle of one that's kind of taken me longer than I would like it to take. But I'm building a little teardrop trailer, a little RV. 
And so I'm pretty excited about it. In there, you'll see there's going to be a bed there. There's a headboard. There's some shelves. But in the back of it, there's a little kitchen. And so you'll open up the hatch, and there'll be a kitchen in the back there. And so we'll be able to take it and, and you know, just do our thing. <laughs> so we're kind of excited about that. But but this is what I want to to share with you in that. Because I think, and I hope that this resonates in your life in some way, because we we have things around us. We have things that we want to do. We have projects. We have maybe another one for you. Maybe you like to do needlework or, <laughs> you know, you like to do craft, uh, crafts and, or you like to do quilting. That's one that I, uh, that's one I actually, I'll admit this, I would really like to do a quilt someday. Um, I like the colors. I like those kinds of things. But there's a process there, right? I mean, when you take on a project and when you start to, you know, think about what you're going to do, there's a project there. For me particularly, with my teardrop trailer, I got a book. I bought a book that shows you how to do it. So I'm not just coming up with this on my own, but I bought this little book and it's showing me how to, how to, how to do this. And um, so this is how it happens in my life. I, I read a chapter of that. I read where I'm at. And then this is, this is the cool part. When I lay, well, sometimes it's cool. <laughs> sometimes it's not. Uh, but, you know, I lay my head down on my pillow and all of a sudden all these images are coming into my mind. I'm like building this thing. Have you had that experience before? You're building it or you're doing it. You're doing your quilt or you're looking at the colors. You're walking through the store. You're whatever it is. You're starting to do it in your mind. See, that's what this word is talking about. Setting your mind on the things above. That you start to do it in your mindset. You are fixed on what that is. What, what it is, the things above in this particular case. You know, you are, your affections are set towards it sometimes, and the reason I laugh at that is because sometimes I can't think of anything else. And I've got to think, 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 think until I actually do it. And then I'm kind of relieved from it. Well, sometimes in the Christian walk, it's the exact same way. When you're going through difficult times and hard times, that same thing can happen in your life where we need, there's a thought process behind it all. What am I going to do? What have they done? And there's something that goes on in our minds. And so what Paul is wanting to say is that if we're going to seek and if we're going to realize the reality of the resurrection in our life, we've got to come to a place where we are setting our affections and our will upon the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. And that's where it's tricky for us because we end up doing that in a lot of different ways. That mindset is super important for us to do. Um, and to, to have there, and so that we can walk out what God has co called us to. You know, the mind is, isn't it, a big deal? I mean, you found that in your life if you're struggling with things? You know, it just really is a big deal. If you're going through a hard time in your life or a dark time, maybe you've had things said about you in a relationship. Maybe you've had friends or people just kind of just, uh, you know, just depart from your life in some way. Maybe they've said things that are really hurtful to you. Maybe, uh, you know, there's just all kinds of things that come our way in our, in our life. And some of those things are really difficult. <clears throat> you know, what do you think about when you lay on your bed at night, when you put your pillow down, when you rest, and when those things come in. See, see, this is, this is a lot of what happens in our life. We start to replay the things that are said, right? Have you ever done that? You're replaying what they said over and over again, and then you're building a case for your position, right? Have you ever done that? And your opinion or what you have said, and all of a sudden you feel this feeling that comes up in your heart, which is what? Unforgiveness, bitterness, my way, right? Have you felt that before? Oh my gosh, I have so many times, but it's, it's in my mind. I've created it. You know, I've created this whole reality around the situation. This is really important for us because in order for us to change the way that we live and the things that we say and the relationships that we have in the world or in your family, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. In order for you to have victory over certain situations and things in your life, it has to start within your mindset. It has to start with setting your minds on the things of the Lord. Now, those are, those we, we would say that that's a carnal way. That's a carnal process or our natural mind. Of course, I'm going to go. That's where the world goes. That's where everybody goes to a place of these are my rights. And I build my case. I build my justification for why I feel the way that I feel. 
You know, these are the things. But this, this verse is speaking against that, saying, no, set your mind on the things above. This is where you're going to have victory. This is where you're going to experience resurrection power. This is where you're going to experience the resurrected life. It's in the changing of your mind. Now, how about this? Have you ever had this happen where you're, you're in a difficult situation and all of a sudden you're on your bed at night and you start to think about a verse or something that the Lord has said or a message that you've listened to and all of a sudden you're replaying all of this in your mind. You know what a really good thing to do? If you can't, if you're having a hard time falling asleep or if you're having a hard time getting away from some situation or something or some thought process, start quoting over in your mind the verses that you do know. Start to quote them over in your mind. Have you ever done that? Have you ever laid in bed and actually quoted through all the verses that you actually know? That is a beautiful process of submitting your will and your affections to God and to his way and to his kingdom. That is a beautiful thing to do because it retrains where I'm thinking and focusing. Um, you know, in my life, when I've done that, there is a, <laughs> sleep comes real quick, actually. <laughs> there's, a, there's a peace of God that just starts to rule in your heart. It's amazing. And you actually affirm you know, that you actually, when you go to church, you, things actually are sitting there. You, I, I bet you, if you do that, you're going to be surprised at how many pieces and bits of verses that you actually know. Because you've been sitting there listening to that and the spirit of God comes in. And when you open up your heart to it, he starts to pour and flood his truth into your heart. And all of a sudden, now I'm not thinking about my retribution that I'm going to meet upon the world, you know, or whatever it is. I'm thinking about him. I'm thinking about his love. I'm thinking about his compassion. I'm thinking about the grace that I don't actually have any rights. I've been bought with a price and I'm his. Look at this. This is what Romans uh, 8, 5 through 8 says about this situation, our minds. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. See that? Their minds are set, their affections are there, their will is there upon the things of the flesh, the things of this earth, the things that they have in their life and that they can produce by themselves. But those who live according to the Spirit, but those who live according to the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There's some interesting things about this, right? If we're locked into the flesh, we can't please God. If we're locked into a mindset that just thinks about the things of earth and the things here and now, my situation, my ideas, my own control, then I can't really please God. The other, the flip side of that is when I am spiritually minded, whatever situation that I'm in, when I'm spiritually minded, I can actually be pleasing to him. Isn't that amazing? That's the awesome side of, that's the other side of that that is so beautiful is we can actually be pleasing to God when we have that spiritual mindset and when we're ruled by that, not the affections of our flesh, not what we think, but what God has said what he's done and what is spiritual. We may not see it. We may not see the reality of it in the actual situation, but we know that he has promised in so many ways, in so many places in his word. Look at this one, Romans 12, two familiar verse, huh? And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here, we were thinking about, right, the one of the one of the things that we're to seek that's above is the will of God. Well, part of that process of living out the will of God is what? <laughs> Being renewed in the spirit of our mind. We know 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we are new creations in Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. We need to let the old just pass. Just go. Those old ways of thinking about people and situations and the things of life, we just need to let that go 
and develop that new habit of really trusting in the Lord and seeing the spiritual nature of the life, the resurrection life that Christ has given to us as a free gift, that it would be manifest in this fleshly body. That is, that is amazing, that we can manifest the spiritual nature of who God is through this body and through the power of the Holy Spirit as we surrender to him and as we let go of our own selves and enter into all that God has planned and all that he is doing in his will. So the next part of this that we're going to talk about, this next verse, it says, for you died and your life is hid with Christ in God. For you died and your life is hid with Christ in God. I mean, this is, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to think about death, right? I mean, we don't like that. It seems to be super final. And, um, you know, we know as Christians that there is life everlasting. I mean, Jesus promised that to the woman at the well. I mean, you drink of this water and you'll live forever, right? And we, we know those things in our life, but there's a finality to death, Right? There's not a response. I mean, if you've ever been to a funeral or something where they have the open casket, you know, you can see that the body is just a shell. It's just there. It's not reacting to too much light. You might be staring right up at the, you know, at the light that's above it. You know, you might be walking by and there's just no reaction. Eyes don't follow. No one, it doesn't, it just doesn't respond to anything. It's completely lifeless. It's dead. It's a hard thing for us to think about and think through the process, but this is what we identify with. We identify with the deadness. We identify this flesh, this old nature, the old way of thinking. We identify with the death. We crucify the flesh. We let go of that. I mean, another way that the Bible talks about it is the circumcision of the heart. The cutting away of what is not needed, that is not usable. For the spirit of God, we cut it away. This idea of death is something that is super important for us. We have to have that, that mindset has to be there of death, that we consider the old things dead. Because then if they are dead, then we don't respond to them. (laughs) See, that's where we have victory. We have victory in the death that happens to that old nature. I mean, if I'm, if I, if you, if we are struggling with sin in our lives, this is where the victory is at. It's reckoning your dead. Look at what it says here. Colossians, the next verse down, Colossians 3, 5 says, therefore put to death your members, which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. I mean, there's, there's a lot of passages that we could go to that talk about the, the, the fruit of the old life, of the old man, of whatever you want to say, the natural person, our natural response to the things of life. There's all kinds of scriptures that talk about it, but we are to reckon it dead. We are to, we are to live our lives as that part of who we are is dead and that it is not responding. See, when temptation comes, and if that's dead, then we don't respond. When those things are poking at us, you know, or whatever, or they're in our vision, you know, they don't have power because we have said that they are dead and we live that way. See, this is the part, okay, this is the part that God gives us a choice on. He does. He doesn't come in and say that part's dead. You're never going to respond to it anymore. That's part of sanctification. That's part of setting our affections. That's part of love. Really? It's love. We're motivated into life in Jesus Christ and making the choice because we love him. He did the same for us. He did all that we need because he loves us. See, it's a love relationship with him and we reckon ourselves dead and we reckon that part of who we are dead because of the love that we have for him. Look at this, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. This is, a, this is, this is an omission of saying, hey, I'm, I'm letting go of that 
and I am living within this life that God has given to me. I am identifying myself with the life that Jesus gives. I've been crucified. That part of me is gone. Jesus says this in another way. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after me daily. You know, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after me. You are considering yourself as you do that. You're identifying with the death of Christ. You're identifying with the giving away of your will and entering in to the will of the Father. And that's how we see, that's, that's part of that mindset that allows us to seek the things that are above. It frees us up from the things that hold us, the things that are always clawing, trying to get our attention and our affection. But it starts with us, you know, setting our mind on him. So there's, there's a lot of things that hijack this in our lives, but here are three things that we can definitely say hijack this. And they manifest themselves in a lot of different ways, right? I mean, the first thing here is our own mind hijacks us. <laughs> I mean, I've experienced that lots of times. I mean, even in the course of putting this message together. I mean, it's amazing because all of a sudden I'm doubting everything that I just wrote down, right? I totally am. And my mind is just going through. Well, that doesn't light, that doesn't line up. That's not, you know, and I go through this process of trying to let go, you know, let the Lord work. My mind sometimes is, is something that internally just completely hijacks the life of Christ being lived out through who I am. And of course the enemy is there, right? Satan, the enemy, the devil, he's there to, uh, to totally derail and to hijack what God wants to do. If we give him a foot foothold there and the world, you know, these three things are very powerful. And when we give way to them, we can live not in the victory that God wants us to live, but we can live in this defeat and condemnation, you know, living in condemnation. It renders us almost ineffective for the things that God wants to do through us when we allow that to happen. Well, there's a couple of scriptures here that we can look at that kind of explain these things in a little more detail. Proverbs 16, 25. This is one of the Proverbs. This, is, this actually is said twice in Proverbs. And it's important that we understand this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Have you experienced that in your life? <laughs> oh man, over and over again, I have, you know, I, I, I would like to say, I would like to say that I have common sense, right? I mean, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I'm a common sense kind of a thinker. I, you know, we like that. We, we want to be in that place where we're the things that we do. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. But you know, the things that we do, we can be controlled just by that that we're thinking through a situation or a response that we have towards somebody. And yeah, it seems like it makes sense. But have we allowed the Lord to actually show us what he wants, what his will is in the situation, what he would do or what he had said? Sometimes it's really great to look back on your life. How has the Lord treated you? How has the Lord treated you in the situations that you found yourself in, in the hard times, in the sinful times? How has the Lord treated you? Did you just experience all kinds of retribution from the Lord and wrath from the Lord? How has the Lord dealt with you in your life? Because this can, this can be really instructive in our lives because we want to rule our life in a way that seems right to a man or to a woman or to a mother or to a father. One of the really good examples that I, I feel like in my own life of this is in my common sense. Um, I don't know how many of you have had children, but probably a lot of you have had children, right? And when you go through the parenting process, there are so many things there that are difficult, right? You're dealing with, I mean, it isn't amazing when you got this little guy, you know, they're so cute and cuddly and all that kind of stuff, and then they exert their will. <laughs> and it's at an early age, right? I mean, it's not like it's like when they're teenagers or whatever. No, there's this little guy and he's saying this. No. I mean, that seems like it's the first word that they actually learn is no. You know, but as a parent, I, I would always, it was like, that's the first thing that you revert to is what seems right in your own eyes, right? Can you identify with that? Can you see that? I mean, wow. That is just really amazing. 
Because I do the things that, and, and the situation, maybe it bears out that I do that, maybe not, but have I considered my heavenly father? See, I don't, I, I don't want to pattern my, I didn't want to pattern my parenting after just what people did or what the books say or what I think is best. I mean, I really tried to pattern it after my heavenly father. Because what he does looks way different than what I think, right? I mean, God does his, his, the things that God does do not fit into my common sense. I mean, the cross, right? It is one of the major, the major examples of how he parents. Sending himself to the cross, that's not common sense. No, what Jesus was fighting against in the garden was his common sense. This doesn't make sense. I don't want to do it. This is painful. This is a horrible situation. I want this end. This is, I'm innocent, you know? I mean, what else goes on in a mind of a man in that kind of a situation? All kinds of stuff. And yet he said, not my will, but your will be done. He surrendered to his father and his father's will wasn't really common sense. That's not the way you think about things. And so many times in discipline, you know, when I was a father, I was like, I want to do this, this, and this. I mean, isn't it amazing when your kids do something, how you think, and this is that mind process, you think, this reflects on me. Everybody's going <laughs> to, right? I mean, everybody's going to think that I think that because of what my kids did. You know, and, and you take this on and this pressure on. But you know what? If we, if, we, if we can look and see what the Father's will is, we can reject our own common sense and we can allow the Lord to speak into our hearts. Um, there were times when I was parenting where I would say, okay, I'm not going to do what I know is common sense. You know, with my kid, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to do what my Father in heaven does. And there would be times where I would say, okay, this is a demonstration of mercy, <laughs> you know? I didn't do what they were expecting. They're going, no, I don't want to, daddy, you know? But I say, no, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to show you mercy. I'm going to show you what mercy is. Yes, you deserve this, but this is mercy. See, that's our father's heart. That's the father's heart. You know what? We need to let go of our common sense ideas. There's so many things out there that we could say are common sense that we do. There's so many reactions and things, you know, in the workplace. Here's one that's really big for me is I got, a, I, I work in a place where there's opinions and we're talking about certain projects and things like that. And sometimes things get kind of crossways. And so if I assert my opinion, all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a, there's a fight. It's going to be a fight. And I just know it's going to be a fight. And it's so hard to dial down my thoughts and just say, okay, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go with what's there. You know, there's so much peace in being able to let go of my own idea and my own thought and my own common sense and allow the Lord to give me, you know, it speaks volumes to the world. It does. When you, when you let go of your opinion and when you, you let go of what you think, people notice. They notice that because the reaction of the world is to just do and to say what they think. It's just reaction towards things. And so when we sit back and we allow the Holy Spirit to work within us, to give us a different kind of a mindset, people see the difference. Here we go. The second thing that we have um, that can hijack us is obviously the enemy. The enemy, he's a liar, and this verse really shows us what his mode of operation is. This is what he does. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. See, this is what the enemy is doing. He's trying to destroy life, which is exactly what we're trying to walk in. The new life, the resurrection life. The enemy's trying to do exactly opposite what we are. So there, there he stands there in a lot of ways. And in our mind, you know, I don't know how all that works. I don't know how the enemy has access. I don't even know if he has access to our thoughts or whatever. But this is what Jesus said about him. John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil. And he's talking to the religious leaders at the time. They were trying to trip Jesus up. They were trying to make his words, uh, you know, uh, really reflect with the people in a way that they wouldn't like. He was trying, they were, they were trying to, to trap him. 
you know, they were trying all kinds of things to discredit him because of the envy they had in their heart, right? The jealousy they had. They didn't have the authority that he had. They, they didn't have the place that he had with people. They wanted all of that and they wanted him gone because he had it all from the father. And so this is what Jesus says to those guys. He says, and the desires of your father, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. I mean, this is, a, this is a strong statement about what the enemy is all about. He's a liar and he speaks from what he is, a liar, a murderer, no truth in him. And you know, this is really good for us to look at because this is what is behind, this is what's behind what's going on in the world today. This is what it is. And we need to set our feet upon the rock of Jesus. We need to remember what Jesus has said about this. The, the, the ruler of this world, the ruler of this age, you know, Satan is there and he is just lying. All of these things that are in people's heads and minds, somehow the lies of the enemy are just becoming manifest in these people. And remember, what is his, what's his desire? It's death. It's death. He wants to destroy life that God has given. He wants to destroy it. He wants to show that God can't deliver on the things that he says. And so in our lives as Christians, we need to be careful of the lies of the enemy. We need to really be careful of that because what he's trying to do is he's trying to squelch the life that Christ has given to you through the resurrection. He's trying to squelch all that, to push it all down. So that you can't be all that God has called you to be. That's his mode. It's destroying life. And so God wants to bring us to that point where we are surrendered and submitted to him that we can actually live out his purpose and his will, the life of Christ through the body that he's given to us. So we need to really be careful of the lies of the enemy and the lies that are within the world and realize that we're not fighting a battle. Um, you know, the life group, group questions talked about um, Ephesians chapter six and the armor of God. We're not fighting a battle that is physical. We're not fighting against people. We're just not. It's not. It's a spiritual battle and there's spiritual forces that are behind the things that we see. The transgender movement, the abortion rights, Whatever you want to throw in there, there are demons and spiritual forces that are behind those things, period. It's people that are believing the lies and they're involved in it and they've made choices for that, but there is a spiritual battle waging behind all of that and the enemy is at work and he's having his way in the hearts and the minds of people today. And that's where we need to understand the battle is not with these people. The battle for their soul is there and we need to be on page and ready for whatever the Lord has in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in with the people of the world. But our battle is not against them. It is against the spiritual powers that are lying to this world. And wouldn't you wanna see the people around you set free from the lying? I mean, that's what we want to see. The only way that's going to happen is through the gospel of Jesus. That's the only way. One person at a time, understanding that God offers life. <laughs> he offers eternal life. I just can't believe some of the stuff that's just flying around and that the world is saying. I, you know, and I get sad. I was saddened this week as, you know, all this stuff on abortion has come out and all of that. I mean, Wow. What people are saying, when you read what they say, they are just, it's, they're shaking their fist at God. They're shaking their fist at God. I don't want your Bible. I don't want your blankety blank religion. You know, that, these are the things that are real on the headlines. I just can't even believe it. It's just right there in front. And they know, <laughs> they know at some point that it is about the word of God. That's what amazes me. They know, that's what they attack. The word of God and they attack you know, what we do, what we're doing right here, building our mind and setting our minds on the things above. So the beautiful thing is, is that our life is hidden wherever the world goes, whatever happens, whatever the enemy throws at us, wherever, whatever mistake we make, right? 
Whatever sin we allow or whatever foothold we allow the enemy to have, this is the reality of the situation. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. If you're a born again believer and you've committed your life to him, your life is hidden with him, with, with, with Christ in God. You're just hidden with him. Um, as I was looking at these verses, I was just amazed at that. I mean, it's a great picture. I mean, when you hide something, uh, you know, you're not wanting anybody to find it. And, um, and there's a process there. You have to search to be able to find it. And so on one hand, I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking, well, what does it mean that we're hidden? What does that hiding mean? What are we hidden from? You know? Uh, and so the process of being hidden, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to struggle with that. In one way, you know, this life is hidden. You know, it, it goes back to what we started talking about, that we don't understand fully what's going on. There's a process of us surrendering and submitting to the Lord, to living out what he calls us to do in obedience, and we're sanctified through that, and by that, we're learning, we're, we're finding. When we're seeking the things above, we're actually finding our life, more and more of your life. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, I was raised in the church. I, uh, you know, I went to Sunday school, a good little boy going to Sunday school all the time. You know, I was learning the memory verses, all of those kinds of things. But you know what? I'm a different person now. I have grown I've experienced the Lord. Part of what was hidden way back then that I never really knew is starting to manifest itself in my life. So that there's a process there of seeking and searching and God revealing. I mean, it's a beautiful thing that we have and that we go through in this partnership that we have with the Lord. So part of it is the life is really hidden and we have to let go of ourselves to really experience more and more of the life that we have with Christ in God. We have to let go more and more. And in that, then we are able to experience more and more and more of the life that he's given to us. So in a way, that life is kind of hidden up. It's locked up in Christ. It's there. But the other idea of hidden is this idea of security, right? That we're secure in him. That we are totally and completely secure. There's nothing that can snatch us out of the hand of Jesus. We've been saved. We've been bought with a price. We're not our own. We are hidden in Christ and uh, with Christ in God. The, uh, another, another thought that came into my mind is what are we hidden from? Well, <laughs> we're hidden from the wrath of God, aren't we? Oh, thank you, Lord, that we're hidden from the wrath of God through what Jesus has done, because we know what we deserve. We know the condemnation. We know the decisions that we make. We know the mindset that actually we have at times. You know, we know where our affections are placed. And sometimes that can overwhelm our heart and we realize, no, we, we need to realize, no, I am hidden with Christ in God. And this idea of with, okay, this is a different, there's, there's several different words that are used for with, but this one is soon. That's what the Greek word is. And what it means and what, it tra what it's trying to communicate is this close um, relationship, uh, something that is wrapped up together. Huh, that is a beautiful picture. That's what we are. Our life, we are hidden with Christ. We are wrapped up with Christ. When we've identified with him, when you were baptized and you identified with him, when you said that prayer of letting go of your own ways in your own life and you needed him as a king and savior of your life. I mean, right then you were, you were hidden with him. You were hidden with him, protected away from the wrath of God, which is amazing. He provided that for you and for me. And it's a beautiful thing. There's an Old Testament picture that I want to go over. And I was just going to do one verse in this, but I really want you guys to uh, know where this is at. So if you have your Bibles, turn in Exodus to chapter uh, 33. We're going to read down through verse 12 and through uh, a ways down through the, um, the end of the chapter there. But this is just really a beautiful picture, and I think that it really illustrates, and maybe Paul was thinking about this when he was writing this down, that we are hidden with Christ in God. This is when Moses is, when the Lord is calling them to move on. Moses is pleading with the Lord here. He's wanting to go deeper with the Lord. I mean, just, this is an Old Testament passage, okay? Thousands of years ago, right? It's not a New Testament or a New Covenant passage, but it's full of New Covenant idea. Look at what it says here. Verse 12, it says, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, 
but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found you have also found grace in my sight. I mean, listen to that. That's awesome. He's saying, this is the amazing thing about this. This is Moses talking back to the Lord and telling him what he said, reminding in a way, not that God forgot, I'm sure. I mean, for us, this is really instructive for us. How are you going to set your mind on it? Take the things that God has said and remind. Talk them back. Say them back to him. This is amazing what Moses is doing. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me, yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And God says to him, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses says to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Wow, what an admission. This is Moses completely set upon his affections, his will, set upon the Lord. He says, I'm not going anywhere unless you go with me. If you don't go with me, if I don't have your presence, I'm not going anywhere. How about we say that kind of thing when we go into a circumstance or a situation that's really difficult or a difficult conversation? Maybe we say, I'm not going to go anywhere or do anything unless you lead me and your presence is there in the midst of this. Confirm it to me, Lord. He wants to do that. I, I just, I'm amazed at this. With, and I think it's a great template for us to desire, to want his presence and to be his people, his children, moved by his power. And God says, God says to him, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then he said to him, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except that you go with us. So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are among the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Again, he says that. That's amazing. And he said, please show me your glory. That's what Moses asked. Show me your glory. And then God says to him, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock. Wow. Isn't that amazing? I mean, this is amazing. We are standing on the rock, right? Our, our foundation, it needs to be on the rock of Jesus Christ. He is this rock. This is a beautiful picture. This is a beautiful prophecy of Jesus being the rock. And God himself saying, I'm, stand by me on the rock. We saw, what did we see there in the first verse of, of uh, Colossians 3? We saw that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, right next to him. And we're standing right there on the rock. You know what? Jesus has you in his heart. If you're standing on Jesus, he's right there before the Father. We read that, that he's making intercession for you. He's making intercession for you at the right hand of the Father. That is amazing. And that's something that we need and you need to, and I need to, we need to repeat these things back to the Lord. You've said that you're making intercession for me. I'm in a difficult spot. What do I do? I don't have it. I know I don't. <laughs> this, is, this is where Moses is at. I mean, his whole life is hinging upon this, really. I mean, he's so, so his, his life and his mind is so set upon this. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. I mean, this is amazing. This is a mortal man in the presence of an eternal, almighty, awesome God. And he's making these statements and these, he's asking this. I mean, we could just say that this is Hebrews. He's in the presence. He's in the throne room of God asking for grace 
to help in the time of need, right? That's what we have. We can do this. This is an example that we have of a man doing that. Anytime we can go into his presence and we can do this. We can, we can pray. We can ask the Lord for that. Such a beautiful thing that the Lord has given to us. This is the life that God has given to us. The last verse, and this should propel us into just the beauty of the last of the verse in that little passage that we're looking at in Colossians, that, um, you know, when he appears, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is a promise that we can stand upon. We're standing on the rock of Jesus. This is a promise that we can stand upon, that when Christ appears, that we're going to appear with him in glory. Look at what Romans 8 it talks about this time. In Romans 8, 17, it says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. You know what? The turmoil that we see around us, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, as we see morality kind of slip, um, you know, as we see that there is no standard, there is no real truth, everything is kind of absolute. Whatever I feel is okay. You know, that's what the world is saying. Whatever I feel, as long as I don't really step on what you feel, then we're all okay, right? You know, I mean, that's kind of what we're saying. That's kind of what the world is saying. There's no real standard. There's no real morality. The only kind of standard is, you know, you don't step on my toes. I won't step on your toes. This is a dangerous place to be. But one of the things that I think that this really instructs us in as believers is we see the beauty of God's moral law. We see the beauty of the boundaries that God has made because we're seeing those boundaries completely crashing. They're just being dismantled. Seems like month by month, day by day, things are just going away. I mean, how much more can go? How much more do we have? We don't really have that much more of standard or morality within our, our culture and our society. We're seeing things that are so divisive, but they're held by the same people. It's just hypocrisy. On one hand, it's this. On the other hand, it's this. They're just colliding together, right? I mean, it's just almost chaos in what we're seeing today. It's a difficult place to be. But for us as believers, this is really, this is really instructive for us to see. When law goes, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. So we, it, our temptation is to see that the do's and the don'ts are, you know, <laughs> that God has these things. You shall not do this. You shall do this. You know, and we put it in that kind of do, don't kind of thing. And that's what the world kind of does with Christianity. They kind of say, well, God doesn't want you to do this. He's kind of a killjoy, all this kind of stuff. He just wants to constrain. Well, we're seeing what happens when the walls actually come down. It's not real freedom. It's all of a sudden what is inside of man just starts to erupt and it's destructive. It listens to the lies of the enemy. It takes the plan of the enemy, which is death. I mean, we're seeing suicide rise. I mean, within people that are good people that have, I mean, well, you know, what we would say maybe is good people, you know, that they're living their life. They have potential, you know, they have something going on in their life and they're actually killing themselves. It's just not the lowly or the people that are in a low, dark place. It's, it's like right in the middle of where we're at. Can you see it? That's exactly the plan of the enemy. To steal life away and to bring death. And it comes because man, the floodgates are open within flesh the willfulness of mankind is being expressed. Anything is okay as long as it falls within these loose ideas. See, the manifold wisdom of God is in all things. And man, the law of God was put there for a reason. It was there and it is in the heart of man. We're seeing chapter one of Romans, the end of chapter one of Romans, just coming to life in front of our eyes. We're just seeing that just happen. It's a good chapter to read through. If you're struggling with the things of this life and the things of this world, the things of the earth, you know, look at that and see what God's, what God says about it. That, that Romans one chapter, it's a definition of what we're experiencing today, but what the world is really looking for and what creation is looking for. It's looking for this time when all things are going to become right. Jesus appears and we appear with him in glory. It's awesome. That's our hope. 
And while we're on this earth, that life God is wanting to manifest more and more in fresh new ways as we let go and as we seek him and as we set our minds on him. Let's pray. Lord, we just really thank you for this uh, morning that we have together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you for your loving um, hand upon our lives. And just as Moses was praying for your grace and just your presence in his life, Lord, we ask for that this morning. Not because of anything that we have done or that we deserve, but because you have promised it. (laughs) You have given it. You have extended it to us through the presence of your spirit and through the life of Christ that lives within us as we have surrendered our heart to you. Lord, we just pray that it would be manifest in this life that you've given. And Lord, that we would see that this life is just a blessing from you. I pray for each one that's here. Lord, if there are people that are really struggling with uh, situations and things in their life, Lord, I pray that you would just bring freedom, that you would bring freedom to their hearts and to their minds, or that they would experience the resurrection power of Jesus in whatever situation that they're in. And Lord, that you would just bring your life and your joy into those things. Lord, we thank you for your promises to us. It is certainly a blessing. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have one more verse that I want to share with you. Um, It's Jeremiah 45. Hey, Aaron, can you put it up on the screen? Switch it over. Yeah, I want you guys to be able to see it because I think that this is a verse that really is for us as I was reading through this. It is, this is for us living in this generation, okay? This was a guy, Jeremiah wrote about a guy, his name's Baruch, and he was a scribe, maybe an academic, somebody like that, who had written down the things of Jeremiah. And he got in trouble for that, and he was worried about his life. And this is what God said through Jeremiah to Baruch. He said, and do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them, for behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. That is an awesome verse. It was specific to this guy who was worried about his life, worried about the nation of Israel. He was worried about what was happening there because the nation of Israel was turning its back on the Lord. They didn't like Jeremiah. They hated him. They thought he was a false prophet. And here Baruch was was actually linked to him. You know what? Wherever you go, you know, wherever you go, this is what the Lord is saying to you, that he has given you your life. He's given you life as a prize in all places, wherever you go. No matter what the conversation is, no matter what the circumstances are, he has given your life to you as a prize. That word there has been translated in different kinds of, uh, you know, translations as booty, as uh, plunder, you know, that kind of an idea, a reward. This, the Lord has given this to you just for your simple faith in him and seeking him. So I pray that the Lord will just bless you wherever you go this week, whatever you do, wherever, whoever you talk to, however, you know, life may go for you. I pray that you'll just see that, that your life is a prize. The Lord's blessed you with it. So God bless you guys. Pray the Lord blesses you. Amen.